Hi and welcome to Destination Michigan. We're here to explore the beauty, creativity, and destinations in our Great Lakes state. Tonight we'll meet some outstanding Michiganders and we'll travel across the mitten to visit the communities that make Michigan unique. Our journey kicks off in Kalamazoo County tonight where you don't have to be an aviation expert to have a great time. Then our next destination is on the dial of your radio. We'll reminisce over 30 years of music featured on the Our Front Porch series. Tonight we'll also visit the Muskegon Winter Sports Complex, where they have one of only four ice luge tracks in the country. We'll then wrap up tonight's show while pulling up a seat, and we'll learn how adding cushions started the Michigan company, Lazy Boy. I'm Courtney Jerome, and you're tuned in to Destination Michigan. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. The Air Zoo may be Southwest Michigan's best kept secret. Filled with huge exhibits, there's nothing small about this place. Destination Michigan's Stephanie Mills explores the Air Zoo's past and hopes for the future. The Air Zoo will take you on a flight through history, but it's not just for aviation buffs. It's a place for people and children of all ages. The name Air Zoo is sort of like a, a I guess a confluence of, of reasons. And certainly everybody understands well the air part of it, but the zoo part I think is even more important. Uh, people think, well, do you have animals there? And in fact, the first five airplanes were named after animals. We had a wild cat, a bear cat, a hell cat, a tiger cat. <laughs> the Air Zoo in Kalamazoo is unlike any zoo you've ever been to. Filled with timeless, unique, and one-of-a-kind aircrafts, it sweeps you off your feet the second you step into the massive front showroom. There are a couple of airplanes that are, are really kind of destinations for some people, very unique airplanes, and some of which don't exist anywhere else in the world. To understand how this place came to be, you have to know about the museum's founders, Pete and Suzanne Parrish, and their passion for World War II airplanes. During the war, Sue was in the Women Air Force Service Pilots Group, or WASPs, and Pete was in the Marine Air Corps. Starting in 1959, they began buying planes and loved getting them back into the air. The Air Zoo came to be actually about three and a half decades ago. And it, it really started off as, as really nothing more than a flying club. A couple of people who owned warbirds really liked to fly in and out of the Kalamazoo Regional Airport. And so they would get together and just kind of have these fly-ins. And then suddenly it was realized that, wait, a lot of people are really interested in looking at these old aircraft. And so they decided, well, why don't we make a museum out of this? Give people from wherever they are the opportunity to come and see and learn about these airplanes. The Air Zoo opened to the public in 1979 and the museum has since undergone one expansion after another as the collections have gotten bigger and the programs more diverse and interactive. We've got about 180,000 square feet now of exhibit space, and people are enjoying every square foot of it, I'll tell you that. We're not just about the idea of airplanes and being able to just see them, read about them, but we've got rides here. We've got rides for young kids. We have flight simulators for the older kids as well to, to really draw them into this experience. We have a 4D movie theater. We've got all sorts of great attractions. 
there's no doubt the number one airplane that really makes this a destination is an SR-71B Blackbird. The only one of its kind in the world. Now this is the fastest airplane ever made, flying at over 2,000 miles per hour. This thing goes so fast, it generates enough heat through atmospheric friction that when it's going at top speed, the length of it stretches seven inches. This Douglas SBD-3 was found at the bottom of Lake Michigan. It took about five years to restore it back to its original flying condition. It looked a lot like this wildcat when it came out of the water, in dozens of pieces and covered in sand and zebra mussels. This plane was pulled from Lake Michigan on Pearl Harbor Day, December 7, 2012, after 68 years, and they have big plans for it here especially for young, aspiring scientists and engineers. It's an absolute beautiful mess right now, I like to call it, but we're gonna restore it to its former glory probably over the next five years. Now this is really a once in a lifetime opportunity because people can come and we're gonna invite people to actually work on this airplane. We're gonna bring science to life for them and we're gonna show them that they can fall in love with science, with their hands, with their minds, and with their hearts. And oh, by the way, if they continue to pursue these kind of opportunities, there are some incredible careers right here in this area and certainly all around Michigan. That's really kind of been the, the new evolution of the Air Zoo. And the sky's not the limit at the Air Zoo. The museum is home to the Michigan Space Science Center, complete with rockets, capsules, and spacesuits. It includes tons of artifacts that give you a real sense of space. We want to take this idea of a more passive air and space museum and create an air space science experience that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. The Air Zoo has come a long way from its early beginnings. Today, it's an affiliate with the Smithsonian Institution, allowing it to trade assets and program ideas. They get many of their displays and artifacts through donations. And the duo who started it all, Sue and Pete Parrish, their legacy is forever preserved in the Michigan Aviation Hall of Fame, also located here at the museum. We've really evolved since then with more airplanes, and I'm happy to say that even right now, we're definitely in, in growth mode with lots of new things that we're up to. If you're planning a trip to the Air Zoo, be sure to check their website for upcoming events and programs. Now, the Our Front Porch series entertains Michiganders at concerts and at home on their radios. Tonight, we take you to a destination on your radio dial, to a program that's brought bluegrass, Irish, and musical entertainment to our state for over 30 years. I don't think anybody starts off thinking, hey, let's do 300 shows, uh, you know. My kids I you. And, and when you've been broadcasting for over 30 years, those shows sure do add up fast. John Scheffler is a man who wears many hats when it comes to his public radio program, Our Front Porch. He's not only the show's executive producer, recording engineer, and host, he's been finding the talent since 1979. Our Front Porch began in our first live radio broadcast was in October of 1979. A couple of things happened prior to that that really got us to the point where we wanted to consider doing the show. Uh, one was that there was a live folk music program that was going out of production. That particular program went around the country recording folk festivals in Philadelphia and Boston and Chicago and out on the West Coast. I spent the next couple of months convincing the people around me in management that, that it was the proper thing to do, that we had this great avenue out with the Wheatland organization and that um, it was something that we owed our audience and we took off from there and we've been around since. Early on, the show showcased Michigan musicians. 
then gradually found bans in states such as Indiana, Illinois, and New York. It wasn't long before things turned international. Eventually made it across the pond to begin to uh, import bands from Ireland and Scotland and France. And so we have expanded our circle of friends, if you will, to come in and play on the show. When we first started the show, we were broadcasting live every Saturday night. And now we do maybe three to six concerts a year, record them for broadcast at a later time. While the radio broadcast reaches 44 counties in Michigan, concerts are hosted across the state as well. Mount Pleasant, Harbor Springs, Traverse City, Alpena, and Sheboygan are just some towns that have been visited. That's some of the most fun that we have with these bands really is uh, taking them out away from Mount Pleasant. You know, for example, with the, uh, the Irish bands, it's always a kick to take them through County Clare and County Roscommon and County Wexford and end up in Emmett County, which was named after Robert Emmett, a, a great activist in the Irish uh, movement. It's great to take them outside the cities so they get a chance to see terrain that's similar to the west coast of Ireland in some cases, and they get to travel through their hometown, so to speak, uh, to reach these venues, so that's pretty, pretty cool. Over the years, Scheffler and the Our Front Porch series have received many honors. The series history was on display at the Clark Historical Library. Recordings from the series are in the Library of Congress, and several recordings have also been donated to the Irish Traditional Music Archives in Dublin. I'm pretty proud of what we've accomplished, no doubt about it. It's kind of a bittersweet moment here at this point, knowing that the, the stick is a little shorter than it was 30 years ago as far as holding on and continuing to do shows. Um, we'll do them as long as the audience continues to enjoy what we're presenting. Hope that we can continue to put some good radio shows together. You can find the Our Front Porch radio program schedule at WCMU.org. While it's no secret that Michigan is one of the best places in the country to enjoy the great outdoors, and as our Stephanie Mills found out recently, there's a place in western Michigan that provides all things outdoors, the Muskegon Winter Sports Complex. To get the full effect of today's destination, you need to be prepared. I'm talking hat, gloves, coat, snow pants, but don't let the cold weather fool you because there's so much going on around here, you might just break out in a sweat or scream. Uh, the Luge is by far the most famous attraction. That was a little better. Only bounced off the wall a couple times. You're gonna hit speeds of 25 to 30 miles per hour here from the public start which will feel like 90 miles per hour your first time down. Do you have lugeing on your bucket list? Then look no further than the Muskegon Winter Sports Complex. Situated inside the Muskegon State Park, this place is the ultimate playground for winter sports fun. Our four core components here are luge, cross-country ski, we have snowshoe trails, and we have ice skating. And each of those has their own uniqueness to them. Our cross-country ski trails are lighted trails. They're the longest lighted trail system in the Midwest with five miles of lighted trails throughout the system. We have two acres of outdoor ice skating space with a quarter mile ice skating trail through the woods, which is very unique to itself. And then we have three miles of phenomenal snowshoe trails that traverse along the shores and the dunes of uh, Lake Michigan here at, this, at the park. The complex was developed in 1984 in an effort to boost tourism in the area. Today, through a partnership with the Muskegon Sports Council and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources Parks and Rec Division, it's become a destination for people from across Michigan and the country. We provide winter sports here between December 1st and March 31st. Each year, we operate with a no-fee lease with the state of Michigan to do this. All the fees collected here are required to be spent back into the facility and the improvements each, each year. That gives us the opportunity to work with the DNR, identify new opportunities, programming, or facilities that uh, will enhance winter recreation in Michigan. The skiing and the ice skating here is phenomenal. Kids can learn how to skate on this huge two-acre rink 
or slide along the awesome trail through the trees. But the biggest draw is no doubt the luge track. I like to tell people that it's an 850 foot ice sculpture. We essentially grab buckets of snow, we pour it in here to the track. And we have a crew of eight to 10 guys and packing it, shaping it and cutting it and, and watering it and just getting it to all the right profiles so that the track runs safe and uh, everybody has a good experience. We allow ages eight on up and we've had 80 year old senior citizens here trying to lose. This luge track is one of just four in the country. It was designed by a three-time Olympian. Now, while it's not used to train Olympic athletes, it has helped future losers get their start. The Muskegon Luge Track was redesigned and rebuilt in 1990 by Frank Maisley, who was a three-time luge Olympian and also an engineer. An Olympic track is a mile long, they'll hit speeds of 90 miles per hour. But to slide from those levels, it takes nine years of training and international competition to even consider making the team. All right, that's finish time of 17.186. Rack is clear. It takes five to six years before a youth can develop. So when the U.S. program is looking to recruit kids, that's what our track serves. That's really why we're here and how we're supported by U.S. Luge is to youth development. Uh, we want to see kids that starting at 8 to 12 years old. Once you're 13, 14, you're really too old. The public portion of the track is about 350 feet long and packs plenty of punch for thrill seekers. All it takes is a quick five minute lesson that teaches losers how to steer and Good. stop. Good, now your shoulders are back, you tuck your chin into the chest. These are slightly bent, feet are pointed in. It feels a little awkward to lay there with your back on the sled, but you forget all about it once you shoot down the ice. <laughs> the fun at the complex doesn't stop when the snow melts. The area is a popular spot for campers and hikers in the summer and people can come and check out the wheel luge. They've also made major improvements to help adults and kids with disabilities get greater access to the park. The coolest part is, you know, when you see folks come out and, you know, a family come out and it's, you know, you, they're getting through all the painful parts of getting skates on the kids or whatever. The kids are, you know, groaning and mumbling and once they get into the experience, all that kind of just goes away. Cell phones go away and it's just, kind of that real experience that you don't find anywhere else nowadays. A real experience, not just for first timers, but those looking to do something they've always wanted to do. Bringing your own skates or skis when you come to the complex is not required, as you can rent all the equipment you'll need at their lodge. The complex is open daily in the winter, but the luge has more specific hours. You can take a look at their website for times and tickets. Slowing things down a bit, our next stop is with Bob Garner. He's been friends with the Knabush family for years, one of the founding families of Michigan's Lazy Boy Company. Tonight, Bob pulls up a chair to explore how Lazy Boy has evolved over the years with a stop at the Lazy Boy Museum. I'll bet you you wish you had my job. This is comfort, man, sitting in a comfortable chair that I'm going to put into park, and then we are gonna visit one of my favorite museums. Today we are in Monroe, a great historical town that is the site of the world headquarters of Lazy Boy. Many of you are sitting home now in one of their popular products properly reclined while watching the show. The story of how this all began centers around a couple of cousins who had the idea for a reclining lawn chair that changed the face of American living rooms forever. It's a great story of American ingenuity. Mike Hauser is the curator of the Lazy Boy Museum and knows that story well. Mike, tell me the story. As I recall, Mr. Knebush, Ed Knebush, and, and Mr. Shoemaker, Ed Shoemaker, came up with this chair that reclined, but it was for outdoor furniture, wasn't it? Right, the very first chair was a wood slat chair, which it didn't recline per se, but you could, with your body, move the back of that chair and elevate yourself like really? this. Yes, but it was basically, like you say, a porch chair or an Adirondack chair. And they had taken it to the Lion's Store, which is a department store in Toledo. The Lion's Store said, you know, we already have plenty of these chairs on the floor. 
but if you put some padding on it or upholster it, you might have something. Padding and, so and they upholstery, did. and that's that's the making that's of Lazy Boy. How it started. After that, then you know we in the late twenties and into the early thirties, then we went to fully upholstered chairs, like you would see today, or if you were go to go to uh, your grandparents' house, you'd probably still see either plastic or a little doilies on the arms. Oh yeah, doilies. You know, a lot of dark colors back then. And then by the 1940s, florals, you know, really coming into style as well. So, but it really wasn't until about 1960, 1961 with the, uh, with the rocket recliner, you know, that sales really catapulted. And then by the 1970s, we got into uh, like so fat, which was a reclining love seat. And then of course, later on, sofas, stationary sofas, sectionals, um, and all sorts of other things as well. I've always found this place fascinating. It's a walk down memory lane for me. How do you like it pre to present it since you're the curator? Well, there aren't many companies today that really feel as passionate as this company does about their history. So we've been able to maintain this museum and an archive, and we have everything from scale models to early uh, product models to drawings, uh, all of the original incorporation papers, tons of catalogs and photos. I like some of the sales demos you had, like the, the plug-in uh, little scale model chair that kept reclining and setting up. And... Right, that originally was done for the furniture markets and then was available for in-store displays. Chris Knabush is a Central Michigan University graduate and third generation family member of the Lazy Boy Corporation, who says the future of the outfit is very bright. We're looking to expand and still continue to produce innovative product and, and the comfortable quality product that we've been known for over the years. Chris, have you got a favorite Lazy Boy chair? It's like asking if you have a favorite child. Um, <laughs> I, I'd say they're all my favorite chairs, but the recliner is probably my favorite. Why do you think uh, Lazy Boy stayed in Michigan? Why not, from my perspective? That's where our roots um, started. We've got a lot, of, a lot of Michiganders who work here, so why not stay in Michigan? If you are interested in viewing elements of the Lazy Boy Museum, you can contact their headquarters in Monroe. Well, now we'll conclude our episode with a little Destination Michigan trivia for you. Which bakery is owned and operated by mid-Michigan police officers? Stay tuned for the answer. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. Our Destination Michigan trivia question for the night. Which mid-Michigan bakery is owned and operated by police officers? The answer is Claire's Cops and Donuts. The bakery business boasts donuts and coffee and other homemade sweets and treats. Plus, the building was once a hideout location for the Purple Gang, a mob of bootleggers and hijackers in the 1920s. Thanks for joining us tonight on Destination Michigan. We hope you'll tune in again and learn more about the state we all love to call home. <laughs>